Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, this afternoon's lecture of MI212. Uh, my name is Matthew Riggs. I'll uh, be your instructor uh, for this week as, as well as next. Um, today we will be going through Chapter 6, the Advanced PKPD Modeling Topics, uh, uh, Session 2. We'll be reviewing precursor pool models, transit compartment models, and lifespan models. Uh, just a reminder, too, before we get started this week, uh, we are going through a change from daylight savings time uh, to uh, Eastern Standard Time uh, over this weekend. So if you do not uh, change time zones uh, this weekend, our course will be uh, an hour different next week. Uh, so please make note of that. Uh, if you also follow the fall back uh, change in in uh, from standard time to or from daylight time to standard time, uh, you'll see no difference in the time of the course. So again, today's topic will be dealing with some more advanced of the pharmacodynamic models. Uh, last week, uh, Mark gave a review of uh, some of the more basic indirect response models, uh, some ways of dealing with. Uh, with tolerance and, and different ways of dealing with delay. Uh, today we will take a more mechanistic view of some of those approaches of how to deal with uh, delays in effects as well as uh, tolerance and, and rebound in effects. And so the first portion of this chapter uh, will be an overview of the precursor pool models. Uh, we'll then move into uh, transit compartment models. Now for transit compartment models, uh, we'll, we'll show examples both from a pharmacodynamic standpoint uh, as well as highlight some of their use in uh, describing uh, delays and lags in the absorption of a drug uh, and so their incorporation within pharmacokinetic models. Uh, and then we'll also touch on, uh, on lifespan models to, uh, to finish this session out. Now, I had mentioned before that the reason that we are interested in these types of models is that they provide us with a, a more mechanistic description of ways of dealing with, uh, in the case of precursor pool models, uh, tolerance and, and rebound effects. Um, if we think of many of the physiologic processes that, that we're interested in modeling, uh, they often deal with precursors and substrates. And ex a simple example of this is neurotransmitter synthesis, uh, where we start off with a cascade from tyrosine through dopa, dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. Uh, if we deplete or stimulate the production of tyrosine, for example, uh, that will then have downstream effects on uh, how much dopa and dopamine, etc., cetera, uh, is produced. Uh, by that depletion or, or stimulation. Similarly, if we take a pharmacologic agent that, that either inhibits or stimulates a function within a cascade, uh, be it cell signaling, cell proliferation, etc., uh, we can deplete or cause a buildup of these precursors. The result of this uh, is that we'll have less effect over time and so that leads to tolerance of our, of our effect. Uh, and then importantly, and, and this we don't get from some of those earlier tolerance models that we we're looking at, some more of the empiric models, uh, is when that inhibition or stimulation is removed, there's a rebound in that effect. So in other words, the effect extends beyond its baseline value. So if you begin at a baseline value of 100, uh, as soon as you remove that effect, let's say you're, you're uh, inhibiting something and, and so you go from 100% down to say 20 or 30%, uh, when you remove that inhibition you would expect a, a rebound up above that original 100% marker. So showing this in a, in a picture uh, and then also looking at the effects of when we inhibit or, or stimulate uh, our precursor. Uh, we have some theoretical precursor here. Uh, it is being uh, produced or synthesized by a rate defined as K0. Uh, typically that's a zero order input rate. 
uh, and the precursor is then converted into whatever our particular outcome response uh, of interest. Uh, for example, before this may be uh, a neurotransmitter and this may be that neurotransmitter's precursor. That uh, uh, transfer from precursor to, to outcome response is, is driven by a first order uh, input rate uh, and then removal of the response likewise is, is driven by a uh, first order uh, first order rate uh, with first order rate constant k out. So when we inhibit k in, so so the 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 spot of interest in these models occurs, uh, or the the site of action, if you will, uh, occurs between the precursor pool and the outcome response. So we're um, either inhibiting uh, this generation from the precursor pool or we're stimulating it. Uh, when we inhibit it, we decrease the outcome response. But uh, if you think of, of this, if you will, as a, as a garden hose, if you squeeze it, there's going to be a buildup back to the precursor pool. Uh, we're going to have a buildup of that precursor pool. And because this is a first order uh, rate constant, even though you're inhibiting this process as you increase the amount uh, of available substrate, uh, you're then going to get a, um, an increase in production over time. And so that leads to this loss of effect over time. And then when you completely remove this inhibition uh, at the end of therapy, um, that buildup of, of precursor, if you will, comes through the, the pipeline uh, and causes a, an increase in the outcome response above and beyond uh, what you started with. Um, and then, so that, that's what happens uh, at the beginning uh, and during and, and after uh, um, uh, the therapy. Uh, you can also imagine too that at some point you'll reach a new steady state. And so you will have an initial uh, uh, decrease in your response, there will be a, a bit of a rebound, uh, and then at some point you'll, you'll establish a new steady state. Uh, similar things happen when you stimulate this response. Um, in this case, you're now removing precursor pool uh, because you're pulling more of it out, you're stimulating um, uh, its, uh, its turnover from the precursor into the outcome response. A uh, similar effect is that you, you, uh, you lose your outcome response over time. Uh, when you remove the drug, so you have this transient decrease in the available uh, precursors. And so again, there's a, a, rebound, um, uh, a rebound in response. And so you're actually going to dip then below your original, uh, your original value because you, you don't have enough precursor to, uh, to produce what you we're producing to begin with. Uh, and similarly, this will result in a tolerance, um, but at some point during therapy, uh, you will uh, establish a new steady state. So pictorially, that's, that's what's happening with these precursor pool models. Uh, and again, you can, you can use them to, uh, in either an inhibitory or a stimulatory sense. Uh, and then I've shown below the differential equations uh, generated from the schematic. Uh, you'll note one thing that I've added into uh, the differential equation here uh, is this term Ks, which is a removal rate for the precursor, uh, which would come directly off of um, this initial pool. Uh, this would, you can imagine a case where if uh, the precursor was not converted into the outcome response, uh, it would degrade over time or it may naturally degrade over time anyway, even uh, sort of in competition, if you will, uh, with the conversion to the outcome response. Uh, the differential then for the, um, um, for the outcome response uh, is, is likewise given, where it's, again, it's a first order uh, rate, Kn times the amount in the precursor. This H sub C is the stimulation or inhibition function. Uh, we'll give an example of that below. 
uh, and, and that is uh, both stimulating the or inhibiting the output from the precursor and then the input to the outcome response compartment. Uh, and then there's a first order removal rate from the outcome response compartment. Now I mentioned this KS, uh, oftentimes you'll see reported in the literature, this uh, removal of precursor uh, is assumed uh, to be uh, negligible. Uh, the reason for this is that you need very rich data uh, in order to be able to um, uh, even closely uh, estimate uh, both a removal from the precursor uh, as well as from the outcome response. In fact, it, it's even more useful in, in those sense if you're going to have that parameter to also be able to measure uh, concentrations of that precursor. Uh, in its absence, uh, again, you need a very rich data set in order to be able to uh, to estimate that KS term. Uh, oftentimes it's sufficient just to uh, assume it to be negligible, set it to zero. Uh, under that condition, uh, you can then use uh, um, uh, use your, your uh, steady state uh, simplifying conditions to solve for uh, the initial condition for the precursor and the outcome response simply by setting d precursor dt to zero and d outcome response dt to zero. Um, again, if we assume that ks is zero, uh, k uh, precursor is, is just k zero over kn and outcome response is uh, k zero over k out. Now, I mentioned before the uh, HC function here, that's your uh, function for stimulation and for inhibition. When it's stimulation, uh, for example, here's a, uh, an Emacs relationship. Uh, the inhibition is simply that same relationship uh, with a negative sign. Uh, the one caveat to that is that your IMAX has to be constrained between zero and one. I don't have it written here, but one other piece that you'll, you'll want to consider uh, if under those um, uh, conditions where you are estimating KS, uh, it should be noted that the um, uh, precursor uh, uh, steady state initial condition uh, needs to be solved uh, with that KS included. Um, and actually the... Um, uh, you know what, I do have this later in the note. I, I give the reference for that. I believe the original paper by Sharma et al. Uh, provides that derivation. So I, I, we have a question here, uh, how do you compare the precursor model and the effect compartment model from, um, from the last class to describe tolerance? Um, the effect compartment model is, is again, it's more empirical. It does a, a fine job of describing, uh, describing tolerance. Um, the advantage, if you will, of the precursor model is if you are also noticing uh, a rebound in response. And, and I'll show some data here in, in just a minute uh, that kind of gives you an example of what that rebound may look like. Um, and so again, if, if from a pharmacologic sense, it makes, um, makes sense that you're acting on, on something that has a precursor uh, pool that can either be depleted um, or sort of held back and, and, uh, and increased over time because of an inhibition, uh, then it would probably make more sense to use a uh, precursor pool. Uh, if you're not seeing that rebound and, and sort of the, the pharmacologic mechanism uh, doesn't make sense to, to have this buildup of a, a pool behind 
uh, your outcome of interest, uh, then it's probably more than sufficient to, uh, to use the effect compartment model. And so what I've given here is an example of, uh, again, some data. Uh, it's taken from a, a real life publication, but the, the data themselves are uh, theoretical. They're, they're simulated um, based on a, approximately what you, you'd expect to see under uh, this, type of, uh, this type of condition. And so I have what I call G block two, uh, hypothetical gonadotropin gonadotropin GnRH releasing hormone inhibitor. Uh, this inhibition blocks production of luteinizing hormone from its precursor pool. And so we've got a, a hypothetical study here where we have three dose groups. We've got three, 10, and 30 milligrams uh, dosed daily for seven days. And importantly here to note, we've got data uh, with follow-up for one week after dosing. Uh, and so we're able to see uh, in these subjects what happens when, when dosing is completed. PK sampled extensively, days one through seven. Uh, and then we have, um, or I'm sorry, on days one and seven, we've got pre-dose samples on days two through six. Uh, we've already taken uh, those, um, those PK data. And we've developed a, a model from that. Uh, so this is a sense where we're looking at a, uh, a sequential fit of the, the PK data and the PD data. Uh, so the PK data has already been fit. And what we've done is we've saved those individual estimates for the, the PK parameters uh, into the uh, non-mem ready data set. Uh, so we can read those in and, and subsequently fit uh, the, the PD model. Now, luteinizing hormone, we've got a fairly rich data set here. We've got data uh, very early on throughout the first day, uh, and then nearly daily for the next few days uh, on outwards again, uh, uh, past final dosing, um, so that we can see uh, what happens when, when administration of drug is complete. And so I've shown here the individual, uh, for on a percentage basis for luteinizing hormone, uh, the individual PD data um, by dose. So the doses across the top, the ones in blue are the three milligram. Uh, the, the pink or magenta ones in the middle column there are the, uh, the 10 milligram. And the green are the, the 30 milligram per day dose groups. And so what we can see is that with the uh, suppression uh, or, or inhibition, uh, of GnRH, uh, we, we see a subsequent decrease in, in luteinizing hormone. Uh, not so much for the, uh, the three milligram dose group. We see a little bit of suppression occurring uh, with the 10 milligram dose group and a much greater uh, suppression occurring with a 30 milligram dose group. Now, a couple things to note though, is that that suppression over the week's time gradually starts to drift back upwards. And that's the, the evidence there that we're starting to see um, some tolerance of this effect develop. And then also notably is that once we end dosing, we get this increase, market increase, uh, particularly at the higher doses, uh, up above um, our baseline value, so a rebound. Uh, and then that begins to, to gradually decline over time. So we're, we're presenting with, presented with this data. Uh, we have some idea that the drug itself is, is acting on a, um, on a precursor to the luteinizing hormone. Uh, and the question then becomes, well, well how do we model this? What, what does our control stream uh, within non-mem look like? Uh, in order to, to try to be able to capture some of these data. And so the next page here, we have an example of a control stream, uh, cut down to, to some of the more important parts here. And I guess the first thing I wanna point out is the uh, input record I'd mentioned before that this was a, uh, a sequential fit. So we have our PK parameters 
uh, being read in from that uh, previous fit. So a two compartment model, we've got our individual clearance estimates, uh, central volume, intercompartmental clearance, uh, peripheral compartment and absorption rate constant. Um, again, those are gonna be fed in and, and brought into the PK model below uh, and defined for each individual um, uh, through, that, uh, through the data records. Um, we're going to be using, uh, in this case, Advan 6. Um, you know, this actually abbreviated, I'll fix these notes here. Um, this was included uh, for a previous version of the model being run under non-MEM 6, where we needed to include this to get the conditional weighted residuals. Uh, this, uh, this line isn't, isn't needed in the, the current version of non-MEM 7. Uh, we then set up our, our uh, model compartments, we've got the, again, remember the, the PK is still in here, so we need to define the compartments for that. Uh, so we've got the gut, the uh, central compartment, the peripheral compartment, and then we've got a compartment for the precursor pool, and then we have a compartment for uh, the luteinizing hormone itself. So we read in our PK model, our model parameters. Um, we use clearance and volume to, uh, to calculate the, uh, the rate constants that will be used within the differential equation block. Uh, we set up a, um, our PD parameters. Uh, because this is an inhibition, uh, we're gonna be using the, the IMAX and IC50 notations. Uh, what I've done here is actually uh, parameterize the IMAX in terms that it's constrained uh, using a, a logit type function uh, to constrain that value between 0 and 1. Uh, we have our IC50, our value for K0, value for KN, and K out. Uh, we use those um, K out over KN, or, or K0 over KN and K0 over K out to define the initial conditions for uh, the precursor pool uh, as well as the luteinizing hormone pool. Uh, PK model set up as, as you'd expect. There's the, the gut compartment, uh, the uh, central compartment, and the peripheral compartment. Uh, just, just typical differential equations for that. Uh, we take the amount from the central compartment here, compartment two, divide it by the scaling factor or the volume of distribution for that central compartment uh, to determine the concentration. And that concentration then goes in and feeds our uh, pharmacodynamic model where we have this inhibition is equal to the IMAX times the concentration divided by IC50 plus the concentration. I have a question here also about, um, again, the, the INFN here is a um, uh, artifact, I guess, if you will, of, of 9MEM6. I, I thought I had uh, updated all of these, uh, these examples for 9MEM7. Uh, when you get the electronic versions, they've all been run uh, on non-MEM7, and so they'll have the, the correct notation in there, and I'll also make a correction to the notes for this. Um, this INFN was used to get uh, specific model output and the uh, conditional weighted residuals from non-MEM6, um, so you can ignore that for now. Okay, so returning to uh, the pharmacodynamic model itself, um, we have again, we've got a zero order production rate for the precursor pool. Uh, it is then being converted from this precursor into luteinizing hormone uh, by a first order process, so Kn times A4, uh, and we are then inhibiting um, uh, that, uh, that transition from the precursor into luteinizing hormone uh, using the, the inhibition function that we defined previously. 
uh, and then that same output from the precursor pool feeds in as the input to luteinizing hormone uh, and then that um, luteinizing hormone is removed by a first order process K out times A5. Uh, and then we have just standard notation here for tabling the amount, uh, the values from compartment four and five, uh, and then a, a standard uh, additive residual structure. Okay, I'm going to take a, a, a minute here to uh, to read through some more questions. I see a few more have uh, have popped up here, so let me try to address a few of those. So a question here of using uh, the logit transformation for uh, for defining IMAX. Um, it's just a, a mathematically simple way of, of making sure uh, that that value will fall between zero and one. Um, it's a fairly easy function to write. You don't need to, to trap any values if they go uh, beyond that uh, zero to one. Uh, value. So no matter what your theta estimate or theta plus eta estimate is as well, I should, should note that uh, this also allows for a fairly easy implementation of uh, between subject uh, variability uh, within this notation as well. Again, all the while constraining I max to be between zero and one. Okay, another question here. Um, LH was sampled at time zero. Why not fix LH to the observed baseline? Um, you can certainly do that. Uh, one advantage to, um, to not doing that uh, is that you are allowing for uh, model prediction of, of what that value, um, uh, what that value truly is. Uh, so you're acknowledging that there may be some sampling error within that baseline value. If you fix it uh, at the baseline value, then you're, you're assuming that that observation was in fact the truth. Uh, and so by, by estimating it, you're, you're actually being able to then estimate what the truth may be. And you're not constrained and, and you don't propagate any sampling error from that time zero. Okay, so again, getting back to the, uh, the IMAX question, if we, we could, for example, take this theta one value and, and just call theta one IMAX and constrain theta one to be between uh, down in the, I don't know if I included that here. No, I didn't, but down in the, the theta block, uh, we could constrain that to be between zero and one. Uh, what that doesn't allow you to do though is to to constrain both theta one plus eta one because you could then have a theta one value of 0.9 uh, and you then have to constrain your eta value to be within uh, whatever that theta is and one or vice versa down to zero uh, and so by uh, parameterizing in this fashion again you're you're forcing it uh, if you will be to be between uh, the zero and one A uh, question here about uh, the difference between the precursor model and the, the transit compartment model. Uh, I think I'll come back to that after we've gone through um, the, the transit compartment models. Uh, I think we can probably compare and contrast those a little bit more once we've, we've done the next section. Yeah, and so, you know, another piece I guess I should add to this is that when you um, do parameterize uh, this particular model in this fashion, uh, so that you have your IMAX constrained to zero or one, you then have to make sure that you do not constrain this, this theta value. It, it, it should be allowed to go both positive and negative. 
uh, so that you can um, you can determine the, the full range from zero to one. Uh, if you were to bound your uh, theta one estimate to zero, um, obviously you'd miss out on um, the lower values of I max. Uh, the S2, uh, let's see here, S2, uh, going back to just some of the PK notation, uh, non-mem itself uses the, the uh, scaling factors, so S1, S2, uh, et cetera, for each of the compartments as its true value of scaling between uh, a, a, an, an amount in that compartment uh, and a concentration. Uh, when we deal with doses in milligrams, uh, and volumes in liters, we often need to take that scaling factor uh, because we want to parameterize things in terms of liters for volume. Uh, we divide that value by a thousand uh, so that we can then observe concentrations, for example, as micrograms uh, per liter, uh, equivalent to nanograms per ml. Okay, uh, A4 equals A4 here and A5 equals A5. I, I, I've done that just so that I can simply um, table A4 and A5 uh, without having to put in, uh, actually I'm not sure, older versions of non-mem, I, I don't think you could actually table uh, the value with A4 in parentheses. I think you can do that now. Um, for me, it's just easier to read into to different programs and such without having to worry about um, that parentheses there. So I redefine uh, a parentheses for a parentheses five uh, as a four and a five and then put those uh, in in my table for uh, for plotting, etc. Okay. Uh, next couple of questions. Actually, we've got some people uh, running ahead here, so we'll uh, we'll move on. Um, so again, that's the control stream. We'll, we'll look at uh, again when we get to transit compartments, uh, very similar uh, notations and such. And so we'll have another chance to uh, to look through those. So yeah, the next page here is in fact uh, a, a snippet of the uh, the data that we were just looking at, uh, the data that were used for. Uh, for the fit to these uh, to the observed data, and there are I guess several things that, that are worth um, worth noting as as we look through um, as we look through this data file. You'll notice here on the first line we've got the typical kind of uh, dosing record, if you will, uh, for a, a pharmacokinetic data set where we've got uh, an event ID one indicating a dosing record. Uh, the amount three is the, the three milligram dose that that subject was receiving. Uh, they received that dose every 24 hours for, uh, with an additional uh, six doses. So that's a total of the, the seven days of, of dosing. Uh, that dose went into compartment one. And again, these are the individual PK estimates for that uh, for ID one uh, that had been fit and estimated previously. Um, you'll notice also at this time point we have uh, a few other instances here where um, we have event ID 2s. And so these event ID 2s, um, again, they indicate that there's no observation at those, um, at those time points. Um, but if you'll notice, they're actually in compartments 2 and 4. Um, and arguably at time 0, that doesn't do a lot for you. Uh, but at the later times, uh, what that allows us uh, to do um, uh, is actually make predictions within these other compartments. So when we define our um, our effect here, where we have an I pred equals equals F or or our I res, etc. 
uh, we're defining that so that we get that prediction in that particular compartment. And so what will happen then is, is for these records, we will get predictions, uh, the, the PRED, if you will, the IPRED will be predictions uh, within that compartment. Uh, that's useful, uh, for example, if we want to then uh, cut down the data to, or the, the output, uh, to understand not only what the predictions are within compartment five, where we have the observations, but maybe we're also interested in looking at the predictions uh, of that precursor pool uh, or of the, uh, the pharmacokinetics, uh, really just for, for plotting and, and diagnostics and understanding uh, after the fact. Uh, and so again, we have, um, we have our, our observed values. Uh, we have uh, the different compartments. The default observation, of course, is going to be compartment five here for luteinizing hormone. Uh, we can already see from this that that's starting to go down over time, even over the first 12 hours uh, after administration. So we have our comment column. If we wanted to remove any of these records, for example, we could put a, a C here to, to remove any of those. Uh, this is just ID one, the time or the, the time um, from uh, from the start of therapy. There's a time after dose column here. Um, you'll see that more in the sort of for uh, uh, diagnostic plots and such. Uh, not for this first dose, but if you if you carried down further into this data record, you'd see that that would flip, switch back to zero. Uh, when time hit 24 and 48, et cetera. Um, one note, the, the time after dose uh, record uh, is not a uh, specific non-mem record, so we've, we've defined that here. Uh, if you haven't defined it within the data set, there are ways of uh, sort of tricking non-mem, if you will, of, of calculating it on the fly, uh, but generally that's a, a data item that we will read in uh, from, the, from the data set. Um, so I think those are most of the, uh, the relevant points from this particular um, data file. Um, I do have a few more questions here that have come in. Let me make sure I've got those. This is, um, again, reviewing the, the control stream and the, and the data file are obviously important to, uh, to being able to, to actually run one of these models and, and, and to develop a model on your own. So I want to make sure we spend appropriate time here. Um, so again, going back to this, I, I did touch on this, but but just to uh, um, we'll look we'll look uh, later hopefully at a spot where I've actually put in the, the theta estimates. To reiterate, when we have this theta one estimate or parameter within a, a logit function here, for example, for I max, we do not want to constrain that theta one estimate. Um, the way that this is written right now, uh, when theta one is zero, I max is 0 0.5. So this theta estimate has to go negative in order for I max to go below 0 0.5. Um, and so if you were to sort of do the, 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 the standard trick of uh, bounding theta one at zero, you'd never be able to get I max values that are less than 0 0.5. Uh, so again, that, that's an important, uh, an important point to make, and uh, one I'm, I'm certain I've been guilty of myself in the, in the past. Uh, question here about using uh, MDV. Um, you certainly could add uh, MDV into this data set as well. Uh, I generally let EVID do um, do the work here, uh, and then non-mem based on its uh, what it sees in the DVs and the amounts, and the EVIDs will will um, will assign MDV accordingly. Um, and so you could certainly include that within the data set. Uh, I, I haven't in this particular one. Uh, 
Uh, going back again up to the uh, control stream. <clears throat> In this particular case, um, because we have um, labeled compartment 5 as the default observation compartment, uh, its prediction, uh, it's looking at F as sort of the, the default prediction. Um, I believe as well when you have in the data set uh, the different uh, compartment statements, the Pred value uh, will be the will be the pred or the the population prediction for that particular compartment. Uh, you don't need to do any more uh, within the control stream. Uh, you already have the individual predictions uh, for each of those compartments at every uh, ops or at every record time. Uh, if you were to table C two, A four, and A five. Um, I had mentioned before about the, uh, the time after dose uh, column. That's certainly not needed within this data set. Um, just a clarification to, uh, based on one of the questions uh, as to whether or not it was a reserved uh, value within non-mem. Uh, in this case, it's, it's, uh, it's not needed, uh, and it's, we're simply reading it in from the, the data set. It's not a, a, a sort of a reserved variable within non-mem. Yeah, and so again, I, I guess just to, to clarify, if we were going to do an MDV, um, we'd have a, uh, an MDV equal to 1 for each of the EVID 2s, uh, as well as the EVID 1. Um, we'd have MDV 0s for, uh, for the actual observations. Okay, so we, let me just, it's been a few minutes here since we looked at the observed data, so let me just shoot back up to those. Um, so if you recall in, in this example, we had uh, a slight effect starting to occur at our lowest dose here of three milligrams, um, although that really tolerated out right after some of the first doses. Uh, we had a little bit more of an effect uh, from the 10 milligram dose, again, we started to see tolerance and just a little bit of rebound uh, as, we, uh, as we ended therapy. Uh, and then with the 30 milligram a day dose group, uh, we saw much more marked uh, suppression and luteinizing hormone. Uh, we do see a development of tolerance over time and then a, a very noticeable uh, rebound and then return to uh, eventual return to baseline. Um, uh, with again with that higher highest dose group, um, so when we fit the model, uh, we we've, we've developed the data here. We fit the model, and this is uh, an example of the predictions from that model, uh, where um, you can see the effect now for the lowest dose group a little bit better in these individuals because what I've done is I've uh, allowed the scales to change uh, for each of these plots. And so you can zero in uh, to see that slight effect at some of the lower dose groups here. Um, what I've shown here, just to, to walk you through the plot itself, uh, is in red triangles, or the, those observed data that we were looking at before. Uh, the little dotted lines here are the population predictions. Uh, and then the blue line is the, the individual prediction for, for each of those subjects. Uh, and so you can see that over the course of a day, you get the suppression, it goes down. Uh, with repeated dosing, you get the tolerance build up. Uh, and then at the end of dosing, uh, you get a, a slight rebound with the, the lowest dose group. Uh, and then as you increase uh, in dose groups, you get, a, uh, uh, you get less fluctuation, first of all, uh, within a day. Uh, you do get a greater overall suppression. You do develop some, uh, some tolerance here. Uh, and then you see the, the market uh, rebound uh, in response 
uh, following that. And again, the, the arrows here indicate the end of that seven days of dosing. So the question is, okay, how does, it, how does the model actually do that? We, we mentioned before that there was um, this buildup of, of precursor. And so if you look at the model and you look at, um, this is just one of, the, one of the patients here worth the data, and you look at the LH suppression shown here in blue uh, over time, you can see that that suppression goes down and then you can start to see, even just looking at the, the nadirs here, uh, that tolerance develop. And then again, that new steady state, if you will, start to develop out near the end of the, the first week. Uh, and the reason that this, uh, this tolerance develops is because you get a buildup of this precursor shown here in pink. So with every dose up until you establish a new steady state with it, uh, it is building up and you have because you, it's a first order process going from the precursor uh, to the luteinizing hormone the more precursor you have uh, the greater the development uh, of, uh, of the luteinizing hormone and then when you remove that inhibition you get that little bit of an increase here uh, this is one of the earlier dose groups um, in luteinizing hormone because you have a transient availability uh, of an increased amount of that precursor. And so that's sort of the, the theory behind it. Uh, and the, you know, these types of models, I think, do a, a very good job of uh, providing a, a, a tool for us to, um, to be able to describe these, these types of data, these types of data. Uh, and in fact, I think there's one of the, the references I gave you was a, a real life example um, of fitting exactly this kind of data uh, with a GnRH uh, inhibitor uh, to luteinizing hormone data. Uh, that particular study may not have had as rich of sampling. You know, one thing to note here, uh, this is an incredibly rich data set. Uh, it's, it's here really more for... Um, um, for demonstration purposes, as well as being able to, to fit a model like this in a, a fairly uh, short time frame, we'll, we'll give this particular example to you uh, so that you can run it um, within the, the SIMI framework uh, for the course. Uh, and so we had to make a fairly small uh, number of subjects, but with enough data so that we could actually fit, uh, fit the given model. So a few points to consider uh, with, with these types of models. Um, you know, I just mentioned the, the fact that you need a, a fairly rich data set. Uh, it's also important to have an adequate dose range. Um, you know, and that, that's really the case with all of these nonlinear uh, pharmacodynamic models that, that we use. Um, you always need enough of a dose range so that you can define where where that uh, sort of Emax or IMAX value are uh, and where IC50. Uh, otherwise, you usually then need to go to uh, some simplification where you're looking at um, you know, a power function or, or a linear function to describe your, uh, your, con your exposure response. The other thing too, and, and you know, this is something to keep in mind as, as you're designing the study and, and well before you're, you're analyzing the data, if we had stopped sampling on day seven after the last dose, we never would have known that this rebound even occurred, let alone be able to estimate uh, the parameters associated with it. And so it really makes a case for when you suspect that you may be developing some type of tolerance and you, again, you suspect that the, the mechanism of the, the drug lends itself to, to some type of, of precursor, either inhibition or simulation, uh, that it's probably worthwhile trying to get samples out during uh, this rebound phase uh, so that you can uh, better understand uh, what this is gonna look like uh, for much more prolonged multiple dosing as well as uh, when you eventually stop uh, that particular therapy. And so again, you, you have to have data beyond uh, the last dose during rebound. 
both during its its rise to the peak and the rebound, as well as it, its return uh, at least toward, if not all the way to uh, the original baseline. Um, I had mentioned early on this uh, degradation of uh, precursor. Um, just go back up to the uh, schematic here to remind you of that. Um, this is another option, if you will, uh, within these types of models that you can actually have a degradation of this precursor. Um, what that does, in, in a sense, is it, it provides another outlet for this precursor in those situations where you're uh, inhibiting uh, the, um, uh, the production of this outcome from the precursor. Um, and I guess, in a sense, it, it further depletes that pool uh, when you're applying a stimulation function to that as well, because not only are you drawing more out, but you also have that uh, sort of parallel process as well. Um, what that tends to do uh, within data like this, uh, let's just go back down to the fit here, uh, is it will dampen the amount of tolerance that you see uh, and it will also dampen the amount of rebound you see, uh, again, because there's not as much of a, uh, um, and that's the case in, in a, uh, um, I, I should make this, this point, that's a case in, a, in an inhibitory uh, situation. You're, you're going to dampen uh, the rebound, you're going to dampen the tolerance. Uh, it's likely to, to actually make it worse in the case um, of a, a stimulation function. Uh, and again, those situations are uh, reviewed fairly thoroughly uh, in the, um, the original paper here. I believe this is, uh, yeah, this is the original Sharma paper uh, back in 1998. Uh, they also, uh, within that paper, derive out the uh, uh, initial conditions for the precursor and the observed response uh, when you uh, include that particular degradation term. Uh, the one thing to consider is that, again, you're going to need fairly substantial amount of data, uh, and again, ideally data within that precursor pool in order to be able to identify uh, and appropriately estimate that KS term. Okay. So that is a section uh, today for uh, precursor pool models. Um, again, there will be an uh, electronic version of the example that I went through uh, available here after the class um, uh, on the uh, MI212 website uh, so that you can see and, and sort of play around, if you will, uh, with the, uh, um, the control stream and, and look into the data structure, etc. Um, I'm going to take a few minutes here just to see if there are any additional questions uh, on uh, precursor pool model, and then uh, and then we'll move on into to transit compartments. Yeah, so we have a question here about um, that rebound phenomena with the uh, precursor pool uh, models. And so if you have a, a situation where, where you're dealing with tolerance, so the, the, I guess the, the important point here is that precursor pool models aren't necessarily the one and only model to use uh, in a situation where you have tolerance. Um, it is the model to use, uh, in, in my opinion, if you have tolerance, you believe pharmacologically that you're acting on uh, some precursor that again is either being depleted or um, bottled up uh, and, and built up, uh, the, having a buildup of, of that precursor. And so you're actually observing then uh, that rebound phenomenon. Um, 
you know, again, there's a, the example in the literature for uh, the GNRH uh, inhibitor um, in a much more complicated sense. Uh, we see that in, in bone biology with things like um, buildup of, of latent TGF beta before it gets converted into its active form uh, and then its downstream effects on, on bone biology. Um, so there are certainly times where that is the, the right and appropriate model uh, to use. Uh, again, it doesn't mean that every time you see tolerance, it's, it's, it is the, the right model, though. It's only really when you see that tolerance with a rebound and, and you suspect the, uh, the pharmacology is there um, for a, a precursor. Um, you know, there may be other situations, uh, for example, here from the, the question, uh, for heart rate or, or FEV1 models where you see a tolerance develop maybe due to other physiologic processes uh, not involving a precursor. Uh, and so you see the tolerance, but you don't necessarily see the rebound, uh, in which case this likely would not be the, the, the most appropriate model to use. Um, probably more appropriate in those cases to use the, the models that were discussed last week the more uh, general empiric models. So another question here. Um, the the um, the the examples I've given here and the, the parameterization I've given was for uh, this Emax model. You know, the question is, well, what if you don't have enough information to, to estimate that um, you certainly can use more simplified um, uh, sort of exposure response uh, mathematical expressions here to, to link into uh, from concentration into the response. Uh, you can use linear functions, you can use uh, you know power functions, um, you can use truncated Emaxes, etc. Um, the one thing that I would caution is then using those simplified expressions to um, to go beyond that limited concentration range that you were already within. Um, so for example, if you had a you know only the one milligram dose uh, or three milligram dose that we were looking at previously, uh, and you were not able to fit a full sort of Emax model, if you will, or IMAX model in that case, uh, and you then wanted to extrapolate out to, for example, the 30 milligram dose group, um, you, you'd probably be have a very biased um, prediction of that. So sure, you can use more simplified uh, expressions, uh, just a, a note of caution as to how, um, how you interpret then any uh, uh, simulations or, or predictions from, from those types of uh, um, simplified models. Um, you know, and that, that's not, certainly that's a, that's a general statement. That's not meant just for these precursor models. And that's really meant for um, many of the, the pharmacodynamic systems that we uh, that were involved in. Okay, I do have a comment here um, about the, the course material that was posted this week. Um, I, I was under a, a bit of a, a push here to get this, um, this chapter out to you guys yesterday so that, uh, that we had some requests to, to get it out the day before so folks could, could take a look at it. Um, and so it was compiled, if you will, with, with just this chapter. Uh, we did not have the, uh, the previous... Um, the previous week's chapter uh, within that. Um, so if you are trying to look back uh, within this one file um, to last week's material, my apologies, uh, it's not in there. You'll have to refer back to the, uh, the, the chapter five posting from last week. Um, 
you know, obviously when the, the course is, is near its end, we'll have all these chapters fully put together so that you'll, you'll have the one final complete book to, uh, to look back on. So a question again about the, um, the, the data set, um, the use of the event ID 2. Um, again, for example, here I'll, I'll highlight just a, a few a few lines of code or a few lines of the, well, that never works in a PDF. Um, if we look here at, uh, at time two hours uh, on day one, uh, we have event ID uh, two in compartment two. And there's, uh, there's no observation because we aren't looking at the, the PK data in this particular data set. Below that is a, more or less the same record except we're looking in compartment four. What that allows us to do is, is from the output of non-mem is to actually get a prediction from the pred uh, value of the um, concentration in compartment two uh, as well as a prediction for compartment four. Uh, and then when it comes to compartment five, we're gonna have that prediction anyway. Um, and so that's where I'm then able to, to pull those predictions uh, when I look at, for example, this plot down here where we have the green dotted lines uh, for the, the pred value. If I also wanted to have the green dotted values for say compartment two or compartment four, uh, I'd have those available by including that event ID to data record for each of those compartments within the, the data file. Uh, otherwise, you, you don't ever get those values back out. So again, we have a question here about um, is tolerance and rebound always, uh, do they always happen together? Um, the short answer to that is no. Uh, there are cases where you have, and I kind of explained this before, uh, with the, the heart rate um, and FEV examples, uh, you know, as, as, as some situations where there may be a mechanism where there's not a buildup of, of something beforehand. It's, it's just simply that the, the body has some other feedback uh, within itself to control things and, and to create uh, a tolerance effect. Um, in those cases where you have tolerance but no rebound, this precursor pool model would not be the, the appropriate model to use. Uh, you'd go back to, to one of those prior models. Um, in the case where you have both tolerance and rebound, then this would be the, the type of model that you would use. Yeah, so I guess this is an important point, actually. It's a good, good question. Um, because we don't have data from the uh, precursor compartment, is it possible to estimate K0, Kn, and K out? Um, not necessarily. What you're able to do is estimate a sort of relative, um, relative amount of the precursor. Um, and... So that's where you know I, I made the statement before that if you wanted to include the KS in there, you really in order to be able to do it and, and have a, a decent prediction, you need a um, you need an observation uh, within that precursor uh, pool uh, if you're going to estimate uh, that KS from here. Uh, otherwise, really all you're doing within this um, precursor uh, pool is is estimating a, a relative amount. Uh, sort of an arbitrary amount, if you will. Uh, in this particular example, I think I've got it set up so that it's, um, I don't remember if it's at 100 uh, or if it's at some other sort of arbitrary starting value. But yeah, if, you, if it's a good point. If you don't have an observation uh, here, um, you're more or less fixing it at, at some uh, sort of arbitrary uh, initial condition.
Yeah, so again, just getting back to the, the use of the event ID, it, 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 it really is just for plotting purposes for, for model output. Um, Yeah, a question here again, getting back to the um, use of the, the precursor pool model um, for tolerance and rebound. Again, this is a you you sort of choose the model based on the observed data, um, and so if you're in a situation. Uh, well, the observed data, and then, then also based on, on what you know, again, of the, the pharmacology of the drug. Um, if you're in a situation where you are observing or you, you suspect um, that you may have, uh, you may have rebound, um, first of all, I guess it comes down to study design. When you're designing the study, if you think you're going to have rebound, um, hopefully you're, you're going to get the data to capture that to uh, either prove or disprove it. Uh, if you do, in fact, then observe tolerance and you observe this rebound, then this particular model, the precursor pool model, does a very good job of, of allowing you to, um, to capture that. If you observe tolerance and no rebound, then the, the, uh, the tolerance models that, that Mark discussed last week are probably a better choice for, uh, for modeling that particular set of data. Um, so again, the, if you use the precursor pool model, it's going to predict out for you a rebound, tolerance and rebound. So if you're not seeing that in the data, then, then you simply wouldn't choose this type of a model to use. And again, yeah, if, if you didn't have this gets to uh, choosing your model based on the, the data you have. If, if, in fact, you stop sampling here and you never saw that rebound, um, you're probably going to be, well, you may be able to still try to fit a model like this, but again, it's going to um, assume that there will be this rebound. Um, you don't have any way of, of proving or disproving it. Uh, and so in, in that situation, uh, you may want to fit the simpler model, if you will, the, the typical general tolerance model, uh, and then consider for your next study uh, of trying to include some sampling design for this so that you can, in fact, either prove it or disprove its, its existence. Uh, you know, again, with, without the data, without an observation past that last dose, uh, it, it's difficult to... Um, it's difficult to know whether you've, you've got this phenomenon or not, and then, and then if you can't see it, you, you can't necessarily model it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and, and just again, reiterating last week, the tolerance model, um, you're sort of pulling drug away into, um, uh, into a tolerance compartment. So yeah, that in fact is how the, that tolerance develops. Um, in this case, again, just reiterating why the, um, we, I think we've talked about why the rebound occurs. The tolerance occurs, it's probably best shown down in the, the plot down here. Um, the tolerance occurs because you're getting a buildup, getting a slow buildup here to some new steady state of the amount of precursor that's available. And so again, because it's a first order process, the more precursor that's available, even though you're, you're inhibiting uh, a percentage of that uh, from being converted into luteinizing hormone, be just by simple fact that it's a first order process and there's more of it to begin with, there's more, um, there's more of this substrate, you're going to get more luteinizing hormone uh, produced. And so as this pool 
slowly starts to, to build up and reach its new steady state, you're going to have that, that tolerance begin to occur. Okay, I think um, hopefully that answers most of the questions uh, on the, the uh, precursor pool models at this point. Uh, again, I certainly more than open to, uh, to further discussions after class on the, uh, on the discussion board. Um, I'm going to try now to get into uh, the transit compartment models. Um, and just a note here too on the, the course material for this week and next. Um, we have scheduled to uh, finish up the, the transit compartment models for PK and PD uh, as well as, as lifespan models. Um, just because of the, the interest and time here on the precursor pool models, uh, I don't know that we're going to get fully through that um, this week. Uh, that's fine. Uh, as next week we're, we're looking at um, multiple endpoint PD models, uh, and I think a lot of this stuff transitions right one into another, uh, and so we'll just continue on. Uh, if we don't finish up this afternoon on, on today's topic, we'll just continue that on tomorrow. Um, so the transit compartment models are, are, in a sense, very similar to the precursor pool models, but, but also at the same time, they're, um, they offer a different... Um, uh, a different way of, of handling a, a different type of, uh, of um, pharmac pharmacodynamic response. Whereas in the um, precursor pool models, we were dealing with tolerance and rebound. With transit compartments, we're dealing with effects that um, take a while to develop after you give the drug. Um, so uh, a couple of examples of this are if you have um, some cell signaling pathway that you're, uh, again, either inhibiting or stimulating, uh, it may take some time for that effect to trickle down uh, and eventually uh, become the observed response that, that you were uh, you're intending to see. Um, and so again, there's a delay before between that initial uh, um, administration and the observed effect. Uh, in addition to, and, and probably most notably for these types of models, uh, so in addition to, to um, cascade type processes, we often see these models applied uh, in um, sort of cell differentiation or proliferation or maturation uh, type processes. Um, and in the, the best way I think to uh, kind of think of these types of models is that if you have uh, a, a population of cells, for example, red blood cells uh, within your body, there is going to be a fraction of uh, those red blood cells that literally were just born, if you will. And there's going to be a fraction of those cells that have been circulating through your body for you know dozens, if not uh, near 100, 120 days. Um, and so there's a, a, a distribution, if you will, of, of ages of each of these cells. And what the assumption is going to be is that those young cells, the ones that were just produced within your body, are going to be within your body for a long time to come. Those that have already been in your body for a long time are probably more or less getting to, to the end of their, their, their life or their lifespan. Uh, and they'll soon be uh, drawn out of circulation uh, and replaced with a, another population of new cells. And so the transit compartments, in a sense, are then binning those age groups. So you're, you're sort of, you've got um, a bin of really young cells, you've got a bin of, of middle-aged cells, and you've got a bin of, of older cells. Uh, and those represent a, a transition through the life cycle of these cells. If you start to either deplete or stimulate uh, the, the production or, or uh, differentiation uh, of these younger cells, you're going to get uh, a pulse of younger cells, but it's going to take some time uh, for that pulse to move all the way through to when you then have uh, that pulse of younger cells, then becoming uh, that pulse of middle-aged cells, becoming the pulse of older cells, uh, and if that um, if that stimulation uh, continues to occur, then you're going to eventually have an increased number 
of young cells, of middle-aged cells, and of, of old cells. But it's going to take some time for that to, uh, uh, to fully come into uh, to fruition. And so that's sort of theoretically how these uh, transit compartment models work. Um, uh, I'm just looking through my bullets here. I think I've explained each one of those, um, both for a, a cellular level, and then you can also imagine a, a similar uh, situation occurring if you're dealing with a signaling pathway as well, which is sort of the example I gave to, uh, to begin this. Um, So describing this from, uh, again, a, a schematic point of view, uh, as I've just sort of, of walked through verbally, uh, we have some production of, of cells. Uh, we can either inhibit or stimulate those cells. Again, this is generally thought of as a zero order production rate. Uh, and then the entirety of the cells are made up by this block. So let's say, for example, uh, red blood cells are, are an easy thing usually to, to talk about. So let's say this whole rectangle here is uh, our population of red blood cells. We've got some young cells here that were just produced in pool one, uh, middle-aged red blood cells here in pool two, uh, and then our old, about to be stripped out of circulation, red blood cells here in, in pool three. Uh, and so this progression through, um, or, or transit through um, these, uh, these compartments represents the cell maturation. Uh, if all we're doing is stimulating production or inhibiting production, uh, and we're assuming that this transition through is, is still constant, uh, then we can use one of these types of uh, uh, lifespan models. And so again, it's a, it's a chain of events. If you, if you increase the amount here in pool one, those cells will eventually become an increased amount in pool two, and eventually an increased amount in pool three. Uh, if you continue that, then by the time these increased amounts in pool one get to pool three, then you're also gonna have an increased amount in pool two and pool one, and then the sum of pools one, two, and three is going to be uh, uh, that much larger than it was uh, to begin with. But what that means is that before you see that peak effect, there's gonna be that sort of uh, delay or lag that it's going to take for all of these, each of these pools to, uh, to get ramped up to, to either their maximum effect or in the case of, of inhibition to their minimum effect. Uh, and the length of time that it takes uh, for them to get there is gonna be driven by uh, this first order process, K-transit. Uh, there's also, there, there's a piece we'll go into a little bit more in, when we deal with the uh, PK modeling uh, as to the choice of the number of these cells. Um, really, when you break these things down into to sort of a full theoretic, um, they actually form a, a gamma type distribution as they, they move through here. Uh, and that gamma is, is defined by this K transition as well as the number of pools that you choose to, uh, to include. Uh, in an empiric sense, oftentimes when we develop these models, uh, we'll start with some reasonable number, three, maybe four pools, uh, and then try um, uh, sort of a, a model development exercise where we either increase or decrease the number of pools uh, and rely on goodness of fit to, to determine for us uh, the appropriate number of, uh, of these transit to include. Okay, so again, how does this look? Uh, you know, we have up here, um, we have up here our schematic. How do we actually translate this into, uh, into non-mem and, and, and make it work, make it run? Um, so again, this is where a lot of the uh, sort of nomenclature and stuff is, is very similar uh, to what we were just looking at for, um, uh, for the precursor pool model. Uh, where the first thing that we uh, we need to do um, 
Now we need a dollar sign in front of advan six here. Um, again, that'll, that'll get corrected. Um, I have stripped out the, the unnecessaries here for, um, or actually the, this just needs to go back up a line, but that'll get fixed. Um, the unnecessaries here for uh, now for non-MEM7. Uh, we, again, we define what our model compartments are. We've got our gut compartment, uh, central compartment, and peripheral compartment. Um, uh, for the PK um, values. One thing you'll notice here is I haven't defined a def obs, and this is going to be a little bit tough to uh, to go through, but I, I think you'll see it once once we do it. Because what we're doing is we're not observing that the observation, uh, for example, of the red blood cells isn't the amount in pool one, it isn't the amount in pool two, or it isn't amount, the amount in pool three. It's actually the sum of each of these compartments is, is the number of total red blood cells that we're actually, um, we're actually observing when we, we run a, a, an ass, um, a particular assay. Uh, the example I've given here, we're actually looking at platelets, uh, very similar platelets, red blood cells, very similar type of, uh, of situation. Uh, so again, we're not looking at the, um, the number of platelets platelets in any one of these given pools, we're actually looking at the sum of platelets across the three pools. We have our individual PK estimates from a separate model. Uh, if we had shown here the dollar sign input, we'd see that we'd be pulling uh, these individual parameter values uh, from, that, uh, from that data set. Uh, we then use that to define our, uh, our transfer rate constants. Now another thing that we, we typically do within, um, within these, uh, these types of transit compartment models is we don't necessarily define things in terms of K-transit or, or rate constants. We're more interested in, in trying to develop some form of interpretable parameter, uh, meaning something where we can say, you know, the platelets live for on average X number of hours or X number of days, red blood cells live for X number of hours, X number of days. And so we actually parameterize this in terms of a, of a mean resonance time, if you will. And if you recall from sort of basic PK, generally if you do like one over K uh, in a first order process, you have that, um, um, that uh, mean resonance time. And so we play off of that, that same uh, derivation here. Where instead the um, the mean resonance time for, for, in this case, the platelets is actually equal to the number of those transit compartments. So if you change the number of trans, transmit compartments, you're going to have to, uh, you're going to have to make an adjustment here, plus one divided by that degradation rate constant. So that's K transit. And so actually you then define your population mean resonance time for, uh, for platelets as theta one. Okay, yeah, I've got some questions here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait on those for, for just a minute here as I, I walk through the rest of the uh, control stream. Uh, again, we've got a, a stimulation here, so we're using an Emax model. Uh, because it's a stimulation and not an inhibition, we don't have to worry about the same uh, constraints between zero and one that we ran into previously. Uh, EC50 value. Um, now here's how we actually, so we, we want to estimate the resonance time, but we actually need to use that K transit within our model. And so here we've got three transit compartments. So if we use the formula of number of transit compartments plus one, so that's four, divided by, uh, divided by the uh, population mean resonance time. And that gives us our K transit value. So again, it, it's kind of like modeling things in terms of clearance and volumes, but then within the model itself, we use the, um, the rate constants. Uh, in this situation within the PD model, uh, we're actually estimating the residence time or the, the sort of average lifespan, if you will, of these platelets. Um, but then we're transferring that back into a, uh, a rate constant to be able to use within the model to describe movement uh, across those 
transit compartments. Now a little bit different here where previously with the um, precursor pool we were able to um, sort of solve out if you will at, at, at steady state what the initial conditions were. Here we're actually estimating this and then there's a, another trick that's going to come up here again because the number of platelets isn't just the amount that's in compartment four, five, or six. Uh, it's actually the sum across four, five, and six uh, and so we're going to handle that actually down in the, the error block. Uh, which we'll get to um, uh, in just a second. But you'll notice that what we've done is we're actually, th this. you're gonna have to go back and look at this because I, I'll, I'll tell you this, this took me a little while to, to get the first time I looked through this as well. Uh, and I usually have to, to review it again uh, each time I use one of these models. So um, if you need to go back and look at this a few times, don't, don't worry, uh, it, it's, it's very typical. Um, so we estimate what our initial value is for, for platelets. That's PLT zero. That's theta five. We allow for inter-individual variability. We actually set each of these initial conditions to one. Just an arbitrary value of one, a relative amount of one. We write out, and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that in just a second. We write out our PK model. So we've got you know, the typical absorption uh, from the gut compartment into central, into peripheral, uh, and then we have our concentration in the peripheral compartment. E is the pharmacodynamic effect. Uh, again, in this case, we're, we're confident that we have enough data that we can estimate a, a full Emax model. So we've got our Emax times our concentration divided by uh, an EC50 value plus concentration. And then down here in compartment four, we're stimulating the production of those young platelets. So that Kn value is being stimulated by this effect. Those young platelets, once they're stimulated, uh, are then transitioned uh, in, or out of compartment four uh, using a first order process and they're getting translated, transferred out of compartment four into, into compartment five, and then out of compartment five and into compartment six, and then eventually out of compartment six. And so that's how uh, these platelets are, are maturing, if you will. They're being stimulated into four, and then they uh, mature down into five, six, and then are eventually removed from circulation. So the amount here, so the easiest way to, to think about this, I guess, is to imagine when we don't have a drug effect. So we have Kn, some production, and it's gonna be at steady state with the rest um, of the, um, uh, the rest of the parameters here. Actually, let me just see here. where we've defined K in. I think I may have missed that. Um, you know, I think that's a, that's a typo in the, uh, uh, in the notes, I'll, I'll fix that as well. Um, so we're actually gonna use sort of the, the steady state conditions here um, to help us define uh, the, the K in and K transits. Um, but anyway, so, so we can assume that at the beginning uh, or when there's no drug effect, your Kn is going to equal your K transit um, uh, times A6. Uh, and then if we remember that um, A6 we've set up to equal 1, Kn is, is really just equal to K transit. And then I may have that up here somewhere if I... It should be set within the code somewhere as such. Um, and so then when we stimulate this production, uh, again, that those stimulated cells start to move through. Um, and then, so, so again, under initial conditions, A4 
four is one, a five is one, and a six is one. Um, platelet zero is the estimated value. So if you add one plus one plus one, it's three, and then divide it by three here, this is the number of compartments, you're gonna end up with just that value at time zero. Now let's say immediately after you start to stimulate this, this amount in A4 is gonna to start to increase of somewhere up above one, but the amounts in five and six are still gonna be one. And so you're gonna get an initial rise in four. So let's say this is 1.1 and one and one, and so you're then going to get 3 divided by 3.1 times platelet. So you're going to get a, a slight increase started uh, in platelet, uh, in, the, in the amount of platelets. Um, at the end of all this, let's say you've stimulated now for a sufficient period of time. So now let's say you're doubling, uh, you're doubling the amount of platelets. Um, you would be... Uh, raising each one of these up to two, uh, and then two plus two plus two, six divided by three. So then you'd have, um, you'd have two times the original platelet amount, platelet zero. Um, it's a bit of a trick to get these, um, these compartment, mo or these transit compartments to, uh, um, to work, if you will, and to, and to spit back a number uh, that's your observation, not just in one of your compartments, but, but all of your compartments together. Um, again, hopefully I've done a, an okay job explaining that. Um, it's going to take a little bit of time uh, to look back at the control stream, I think, and, and make sense of that um, I'm on your own. So a question here, uh, why three compartments? Uh, three compartments here just because it makes for a nice example. Um, again, oftentimes, and if you look in the literature uh, at these types of models, uh, you may use four, five, six compartments. Um, generally, part of the model development will involve a few steps of evaluating different numbers uh, of these transit compartments. A few things to keep in mind when you do that. Um, this number down here needs to change. You need to add all of those compartments together uh, into this effect. Uh, you also need to change the number up here uh, that translates the, uh, the, the lifespan time into K transit. Uh, and then obviously you need to write the additional differential equations and add them up into the, the model block as well. There's a question here um, about the sum of the pools. Um, that I guess I, I, I need some, some clarification on. Um, in this case, you're assuming that each of these, um, uh, each of these uh, pools, if you will, or this is, this is the sum of the, the sampling site. So if you're, if you're pulling plasma, um, within that plasma, there are each of these each of these pools. So it's conceptually different from uh, the compartments that we're we're used to dealing with, where each compartment is a different sampling site, if you will. Um, in this case, the the pools themselves are all within the same sample. They just represent different uh, populations or or age bins, if you will, uh, of those particular pools. Um, hopefully that explains uh, that particular question. 
Um, there is a question here about the um, K transit of, of N plus one uh, over MRT versus just N. You know, I may have uh, I may have flipped that because when we're dealing with um, uh, the PK models, we're actually dealing with the N plus one. Um, I'll, I'll check on that. Um, yeah, the assumption that we make here that we have the same transit uh, value from one pool to the next uh, is absolutely an assumption of identifiability. Um, if, uh, for example, you're dealing with a situation where the drug not only is affecting the, the stimulation but also maybe affecting the, the aging process, um, this type of a model probably isn't going to uh, fully capture that. Uh, you have to, in order to be able to identify this type of model, make that assumption that that K-transit is the same throughout each of these transit compartments. Um, the lifespan models may do a little bit better job, um, which are more or less delay differential equations in, in handling that. Um, but again, the, the, if, you're, if you're running into that type of a situation, you're, you're probably going to have to deal with... Uh, some type of assumptions as to uh, how that process is occurring um, uh, or use some other form of, of the model. Um, yeah, question here. I've, I've talked about stimulation. Uh, this model absolutely can be used for, for inhibition as well, so things like myelosuppression. Um, and this is exactly the type of, of model that's been used, uh, for example, by um, uh, uh, Lena Freiberg and, and Mats Carlson, et cetera, for neutropenia uh, descriptions. Um, there are some additional components of that if you're reading those publications. I think they have some feedbacks within this. Um, this is kind of a simplified version uh, of their model, but certainly a, a key component uh, of those models. Okay, uh, question here about the type flag. I'll get into that as I, as I get into the data uh, here in, in a few minutes. Um, certainly not a, a limit per se in the number of compartments that you, you assign, although there's a, a point of diminishing returns. Uh, so again, generally we start off with, with somewhere between the four and six range. Uh, we may uh, add or remove a few compartments to, to determine what that point is. Um, but generally you'll find that, that when you go beyond that, you're, you, you're, um, you don't have any gain, you're, you're just increasing your computational time. Um, yeah, so I had mentioned before the, the definition of, of KN. Uh, it should equal K transit. I, I didn't see it within the uh, control stream. Um, and so uh, it's also equal to um, K transit times not the, um, the initial uh, platelet zero, um, but it's actually equal to the initial um, uh, the initial A6 here or, or, or A4, if you will. Um, because A4 and A6 are both equal to one, um, your Kn is equal to K transit times one, so your Kn is equal to, to K transit. Um, that should be up here somewhere in the code. As I, I cleaned it out, I probably inadvertently deleted that. Um, so I'll make sure that's back in there. Yeah, and, and, and so a question here, getting back to um, all of these pools uh, being in the same um, sampling compartment. So again, you're, you're sampling this big block here. Uh, immediately, there's going to be an increase, for example, in pool one. Um, 
So you will see some initial effect. This, this isn't, um, I guess this is one of the differentiating uh, factors between a delay differential um, or in the pharmacokinetic sense of using a, a strict ALAG parameter is that you do start to see some immediate response, but what you don't see is a, a direct response uh, where that peak effect is occurring uh, more or less at the same time or immediately after the peak in, in pharmacokinetics. Usually there's a much longer delay uh, before you see the peak because it takes time for not only that response to be seen in, in pool one, but also to be seen uniformly through, uh, through each of these. Um, and we'll see that when we look at, at some of the data uh, shortly here. Um, and again, the, the more question here about the more uh, compartments, the longer the delay, uh, that's true if you keep the same K transit. Um, again, I, I have an example in here uh, for the um, uh, for the oral absorption, where I show how you change when you change the the number of compartments in K transit. Um, you really can can change the shape of this sort of peak effect, if you will, as well as um, uh, the amount of time that it takes to get through and and to that peak effect, and that's where that. Um, sort of gamma distribution, if you will, based on the parameters uh, K transit and, and the number of compartments uh, come in. So we'll, we'll see that here in, in a few minutes or, or well, maybe next week. Yeah, okay, so yeah, somebody familiar, I guess, with the, um, the model that, that uh, Lena Freiberg had used, they actually have out here a, a circulation compartment um, where they use that as the, the sampling compartment. Um, you then don't sum across the, the different compartments. It, 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 sure, that works, um, just different way of, uh, of coding the model. Um, yeah, question here again, getting back to the, um, the summation of this. Really, in, in, in this parameterization of the model, you only have to sum these three together. Uh, so again, you have one plus one plus one divided by the number of compartments. Uh, multiplied by that initial condition, which gives you your initial condition. Uh, and then again, as the amounts in these compartments increase, um, you're going to see uh, that total amount of the total effect change. Um, so again, that, that's just really how you, um, how you parameterize this, this particular model. Um, Another question about how applicable these models are to single dose versus uh, multiple dose situations. Really, the the effects that you see can extend way beyond uh, the first dose, so sort of the delay that you see. Um, particularly here, I think we'll see in the, the platelet example, uh, it takes numerous doses before you you um, you establish a, a steady state pharmacodynamically. Uh, even though you've already established uh, steady state pharmacokinetically. And I think really that's the, the point of these models is that, that uh, those situations do occur and, and this allows you to, um, uh, to capture uh, that long of a delay above and beyond what you may get from a, a more standard, just indirect model.
Okay, so a question here about um, the use of this uh, this type um, this type flag. I, I've actually commented it out here, um, but this is just a, a point to make. When we look at the, um, did I show you the data for here? I didn't show you the data. Okay, um, it, it's commented out here, but the the observations here. Um, in the, the data set itself are actually all within or, or listed under compartment two. Again, because we are telling non-mem what this value is, it doesn't really care at that point which compartment it came from. We're not saying, you know, ipred equals f or ipred equals um, uh, f, the letter f and not eff. Um, and so at that point, you can put the observation within the data set anywhere you want. In this particular case, I actually put it underneath compartment one with a type flag, or compartment two with, with a type equal to one flag. Uh, and then the PK data are also in that same exact compartment with a type equal zero flag. Uh, in the situation where I was fitting uh, PK and PD simultaneously, uh, I could then have those um, observations both in, in compartment two, um, but differentiated within this error block by that type flag. Um, not necessary to, to deal with that in this particular example. Uh, again, it doesn't matter where I put the observations uh, um, because non is only gonna be looking at one set of DVs here. Uh, because there's only one endpoint, uh, and so we don't have to worry about that in this particular uh, in this particular example. Okay, so a few points to consider uh, for the transit compartment models. Um, so without observations here within the individual transit compartments, which we very rarely would have, um, unless maybe this was more of a cascade system uh, where we would have um, observations of, of potentially the, the, the different um, uh, signaling uh, cytokines or, or whatever as, as you move through, um, through the cascade. Uh, we don't typically have um, observations within those individual compartments. And so, as we mentioned before, uh, that K transit um, must be considered or set the same uh, for each, uh, each transit between the compartments, otherwise it's not identifiable. Um, and uh, again, at steady state, all transit compartments are equal. This is, I guess, another important thing is that, that you can't start off with um, you know, 90% of your cells within compartment one and only 5% in the other two, um, you have to make the assumption that they're, they're uniformly distributed um, throughout those, um, those transit compartments. Um, there was a, I did miss, I just realized I missed an, an earlier question. Um, Question uh, is if there are delays, um, tolerance, and rebound happening together, um, could we use a, a combination of both the transit compartment model and the precursor model? Absolutely. Um, there are several published examples um, of this. Uh, and in fact, the, the assignment uh, at the end of this lecture is, is sort of predicated off of that, although it's not entirely a, a precursor pool model. It, it's a combination of, of the theories of, of precursors and, and transits. <clears throat> okay, we've got about 10 minutes remaining here in the, in the lecture time this afternoon. Um, I think what I'm going to try to do is get through uh, the um, PK models with, with transit compartments, at least, at least get fairly well into it. Um, a lot of the, the theory behind this is very similar to what we we're just looking at uh, for um, uh, for the PD models. It's really just imposing a delay 
Now, not on the back end between the concentration and the response, uh, but really on the early end between um, when we administer the drug and when we actually start to see it within circulation. Um, it's actually a very useful model. Um, I, I've used it a, a few times now myself um, in describing these types of delays because generally what we see when we look at these um, concentration profiles where we do have a situation where there's a delay, uh, again, it's not a, a true on-off switch where all of a sudden out at, say, an hour we start to see drug. It's that we just slowly start to see drug trickling in as it trickles through those initial um, into and then starts to go through those initial transit compartments um, or delay compartments in this case. Um, and then there's your typical sort of first order absorption and then elimination of the drug. Um, you know, this delay can be due to, to lots of different reasons. It can be due to, you know, disintegration, dissolution of the, the drug pot product, um, or the amount of time it takes for it to get out of the stomach and, and to the absorption site, and then actually through, uh, through the GI uh, lumen and, and into circulation. Um, and, you know, more and more, I think we're starting to see drugs that sort of follow these patterns. Um, Typically, what we've done in the past uh, is we've imposed sort of this on-off uh, delay or this lag time where there's no absorption and then all of a sudden absorption can occur. Um, this leads oftentimes to estimation uh, difficulties uh, when you start to uh, look at differences between individuals. Um, and so I think having a more continuous model such as uh, the uh, transit compartment model does a better job of not only describing the data, but it but allows for more flexibility uh, in estimation as well. And so this really looks just like what we had for the pharmacodynamic sense, but again, we're, we're hooking it onto the, the early part of the PK model where we give a dose, that dose transitions through uh, lag compartments, uh, and then eventually uh, finds its way into the absorption compartment and then is absorbed uh, into into circulation. Uh, this is the case where that mean transit time through these absorption uh, compartments um, uh, is equal to the n plus one over k transit. Um, and the implementation uh, is very similar to uh, the implement implementation uh, in the, the PD models. Um, where again, we've got your typical gut. I've, I've kept the ordering here of compartments one, two, and three the same because that's what we're used to kind of seeing, if you will. Again, it doesn't matter what order you put it in um, as long as you're, you write the differentials uh, appropriately. Uh, so we've got compartment one being the gut, two is the central compartment, uh, the plasma, uh, and then a peripheral compartment. And then we have our three transit compartments listed here as gut two, gut three, and gut four. Uh, PK, in this case, we're actually estimating the PK. So we have theta uh, values put in for our clearance or volume, Q, uh, peripheral volume. Uh, we have an absorption rate, Ka. Uh, so again, we're still assuming that once it gets to this absorption site, that it's going to be absorbed by a first order process. Uh, it's really just going to take some time for uh, the dose to fully get to um, either disintegrate out of the tablet um, or fully uh, um, be transferred to the, the actual absorption site. Um, so I, I made the statement here about N plus 1 and then I, I didn't do it here. Um, but that K transit is going to be N plus one uh, over um, the uh, uh, mean transit time. Um, so again, that, that, that just needs to be uh, switched there to uh, four. Um, and then the differentials that we write for that, uh, again, it's a little bit backwards here because the uh, the lags are actually down here in four, five, and six, uh, and then those lags feed into um, um, into the absorption from the the central compartment. And uh, 
Okay, right, yeah, because this is uh, Ka, the absorption from that final um, uh, transit compartment. So you have the dose uh, coming out of the initial dosing uh, compartment uh, into uh, the first lag compartment, out into the second lag compartment, out into the third lag compartment, and then ultimately out into um, uh, out into the circulation. So the the nomenclature here is is a little bit uh, backwards from what I just said. This six compartment six is actually this final uh, in the the model I've just shown. Compartment six is actually this final absorption compartment. Um, And I'm looking at the time here. Uh, we're coming up on the last few minutes. Um, I mentioned before that uh, another alternative uh, to parameterizing these types of absorption models is to not actually define a number of uh, um, a number of compartments um, or the the um, or the number of compartments but to actually fit a sort of gamma distribution, if you will, uh, to that dosing compartment. Um, I've shown that here. I think I'm gonna stop before I will pick up from here next week. Uh, if you have some time, you can look through, um, look through the notes for this next section. Uh, again, I've given uh, some notations for it up here, the mathematics behind it, and then an actual implementation of it. Um, and so we'll pick up from there. We'll actually work through this control stream uh, starting with next week. Um, if anyone's interested, the, um, the assignment for this week um, was actually based on, um, uh, based on the PD transit compartment as well as precursor pool uh, compartment. And so you can start to look at that. Um, we will... Uh, maybe use the lab this week um, to go through uh, through that exact example and then and then we'll touch some more on it uh, for next week as well um, but if you want to just take a look at it um, put some thought into how you would handle it uh, and then we will go through that uh, uh, this Friday at uh, during our normal lab time So again, that ends uh, this lecture time. Uh, again, I'm available through the uh, through the discussion site for for any questions, uh, and we will continue um, uh, continue working through these notes uh, and then touch into uh, multiple endpoint models next week as well. Uh, and a reminder of the the time change. Uh, we will be uh, going from daylight savings to Eastern Standard Time next week. Uh, so please make adjustments if necessary. Thank you.